These giant tech companies have so much power. Big tech poses the single greatest threat to free speech in our country today. So much economic power and so much political power. Everywhere you turn these days, big tech companies are under fire. Instagram's supposedly addictive and negative effects on teenage girls have lawmakers comparing its parent company, Facebook, to big tobacco. Conservatives like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and Texas Governor Greg Abbott have signed controversial legislation legislation banning social media platforms from moderating content and kicking off users for political reasons. Supreme Court Associate Justice Clarence Thomas has said businesses like Twitter and YouTube should be subject to strict federal regulation. Liberal legislators in Colorado have proposed creating a digital communications commission that would have the power to change how platforms do business in the name of fighting hate speech and misinformation. Lawmakers in at least 38 states have introduced over 100 laws in the past couple of years to regulate online speech and business practices. In his new book, Tech Panic, Reasons Robbie Suave says such attacks are modern-day witch hunts that fall apart under even mild scrutiny. They're the contemporary version of past freakouts over video games, rock music, and comic books. We shouldn't fear Facebook or the future, writes Suave. The actual threat, he says, comes not from private companies, but from politicians, woke mobs, social conservatives, and activists whose real goal is to limit speech they don't like. Robbie Suave, thanks for talking. My pleasure. Give me the elevator pitch of Tech Panic, why we shouldn't fear Facebook and the future. Sure. Uh, panic about social media is very popular right now. Uh, it's, it's bipartisan. It's cross all over the ideological spectrum. People as different as Elizabeth Warren and Josh Hawley and Joe Biden and Donald Trump all think we need to do something. The government needs to do something about social media, about big tech. My book argues no. That's wrong. Uh, the concerns are overstated. The solutions that these people offer are very bad. Don't they, from a range of not fixing the problems that they're talking about to they'll make things worse to the problems they're talking about aren't even problems. So I, I get into all the various, the most popular um, panics about social media and discuss to the extent they're true and what should be done about them. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through them and we're gonna come to things like Section 230 and antitrust actions against uh, you know big tech uh, but first you know the the kind of panic de, de jour uh, which came up after in a big way after you know the book was was printed has to do with Facebook and Instagram uh, having a terrible negative effect particularly on young girls this is Instagram a report came out uh, the Wall Street Journal talked it up about uh, Instagram and Facebook researchers had looked at the platform itself and said, oh my God, you know, Instagram is driving young girls, you know, to anorexia and worse. What is wrong about that? Right. So it looks to me like Facebook has come up with some internal data showing a mild increase in, uh, in feelings of depression or, or not being good enough or not being pretty enough among teen, teenage girls. I think their figure was a third of their teenage female um, users were experiencing heightened depression because of Instagram. The idea being that Instagram is showing you more into the search feature. It's showing you, you know, it's curating for you a feed of images based on things you've been interested in. So you're gonna see more makeup, more models, more pretty people. Also Instagram itself is this kind of deceptive medium where you're seeing the, the best, the most glamorous, the most attractive version of, ev of everyone. And that can lead to feelings of, uh, of insecurity about your own appearance. Uh, et cetera. So I think from looking at, and, and I, I looked at a lot of other data for this book, um, if you want to say there are reasons to be, we should be concerned, you know, we should keep studying this, uh, it might be having a negative effect on some teenagers. Absolutely. I, I, I think that could very well be the case and, and we should continue to look at these things. Um, the, the idea that there's some broad, like, insurmountable problem for the vast majority of social media users does not seem well founded. Um, you know, you can and you can cherry pick this data a lot of ways for every statistic about how teenage girls have become, you know, more anxious or more unhappy in the last 10 years. You can find one showing that, well, this other category of social media user hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's really hard to measure these things. And, and also it, it looks some of the data looks to me like 
the users who uh, who use social media too much or e extreme all day have some bad mental health outcomes. But so do the teens who don't use social media at all. The ones who are not con who are loners who are not connected with their friends. So I mean, part of the the concept of the book, and you know, it's in the title, Tech Panic, is. I mean, social media has become kind of like the garbage bin that we dump all of our anxieties in about everything that is kind of going wrong right now. Right. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about it in terms of it's just like any it, it, there's some comparisons to remember video game panic over violent video games. And then it turned out that a lot of preliminary research or even assumptions, not even research yeah. that that video games were going to make kids, teenage boys, more violent, didn't pan out. In fact, it's, it might even be true that for like the most at risk, capable of violence, <laughs> young men, it might even deter them from it because it's an outlet other than engaging in violence. Um, so I expect to see some of that. But also, you, you know, you can still say it's perfectly appropriate for parents to limit the amount of time their teenagers spend on social media. I was only allowed to play an hour of video games on weeknights because left to my own device, when I was a kid, I would I would have played video games all night long. But that was the rule, and that was a healthy rule, and I think it's totally reasonable. Jonathan Haidt, who is concerned about this, yeah. but he said that that's a practical parental intervention, requires the government to do nothing whatsoever, just take the phones away from the Well, kids I guess, uh, you know, before we go to, you know, whether or not there's a public policy, uh, you know, dimension here, it's that question of, um, in the 90s, you were talking about when video games really came online, like high um, intensity and, and like with good graphics video games that also uh, uh, coincided with cable TV coming under real scrutiny. This was the Clinton administration and people like Janet Reno, the attorney general, uh, constantly talking about that. One of the findings was that kids who watch like 10 hours of TV a day had bad outcomes, but it was not even clear that it mattered what was on the screen. It was right. more something is off if you're using social media or any media for that kind of well, and if you if you stay up all night looking at your phone just as right. if you stayed up all night doing anything you're going to be tired you're going to be more sluggish in school the next day lack of sleep correlates very obviously with uh, with bad mental health outcomes and other pro struggles you might go through so i absolutely agree if it's if it's interrupting the sleep patterns of young people that's probably not healthy for them but that's not even a that's not really a problem with the technology itself you write a lot about the book uh, in the book about the documentary the social dilemma which says you know at various points this was a netflix um, documentary that showed that um, you know social media is different it's not like anything in the past what I want people to know is that everything they're doing online is being watched, is being tracked. Every single action you take is carefully monitored and recorded. A lot of people think Google's just a search box and Facebook's just a place to see what my friends are doing. What they don't realize is there's entire teams of engineers whose job is to use your psychology against you. Scientists, psychologists, you know, data scientists have figured out ways to um, hook you and addict you. In that um, Wall Street Journal uh, story about uh, Instagram, uh, towards the end, Gene Twenge, the social psychologist, talks about how this sounds a lot like R.J. Reynolds, a tobacco company, hiding data you know, about the addictiveness of its product. Um, can you engage that a little bit? Is there something uniquely addictive and different about social media, or is this the video game panic, the um, you know the the movie panic in the twenties, uh, the novel panic in the early nineteenth century. I mean, right. you know, right. how how seriously should we take the idea that no, this is categorically different because we have scientists manipulating us and giving us endorphin hits. Right, uh, because they're inflating yeah. their own their own contributions to these projects. Right. Um, so it's it. I find it a little hard to believe. I also think these people since they're so engaged with the technology, these were the people most likely to be addicted to it, to be so online. So of course they're going to see it as a problem. I mean, journalists who spend, and policy people who spend all day on Twitter are in, you know, inveighing against Twitter and all the harms it's causing, but most people aren't on Twitter all day, that's right. just you. So it's, it's, it's one's own uh, like uh, 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 being addicted to the, to the technology is I think causing uh, the, the, the policy maker in concerned group of people to be worried this is having the same effect on everyone else when it's not. I think probably there are aspects of these technologies that are addictive or can be addictive. Um, but even 
like, like gambling is addictive, right, for some people. Some people shouldn't gamble. You shouldn't go to the casino. You'll bet your wedding ring. You'll bet the farm, whatever. You'll um, bet the uh, rent money, as uh, Bill Bennett, who had a gambling problem, talked about. Right. But most people can go to the casino, spend a little bit of money, have a good night, go home. So even so, most of the society is not... I, I don't think is vulnerable to this kind of thing. So then, what you're gonna you're going to regulate it or legislate it because there's a minority of people who have have some kind of struggle with regulating their own internal use and might have some mental health outcome that's bad. That's that's now it's getting into like a very far afield problem. In your discussion of uh, some of the ways in which people talk about these as addictive or as threats or as you know uh, social media as controlling its users. Um, you make reference to a book from the 50s called The Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packard. Could you summarize that and kind of explain why that, you know, yeah. is, is good to know about when, when you're thinking about today's tech path? Yeah, this is the Mad Men era. Uh, and Vance Packard had come out with this book about subliminal uh, advertising, subliminal messages in advertising, um, and how, you know, you're no longer, you the consumer are no longer in charge of what you're buying because there's a, there's a you know, it's being, you're being, uh, manipulated by some subliminal message in in commercials and in posters, etc. Um, and that advertising agencies had ma they availed directly. themselves of psychologists, right. depth the depth boys, I think they were called. They'd hacked the human brain, just yeah. like the people in the social dilemma are saying now. But of course, none of that was true. Subliminal messaging is a fiction. Um, a actual people who worked in ads understood that they didn't have that power. Um, it, it, like this is this is just a, this is a very clearly made up moral panic. So because we've gone down this road so many times, we should be like extremely cautious. I mean, the social dilemma is very concerned about what ads the companies are, and they, and they treat as nefarious this process that is not necessarily nefarious. That that the you know these sites make money by selling advertisements because they've learned something about your habits based on what you've clicked on. It's actually better to see more relevant advertisements. Like if I watch TV, I might get an advertisement for a car I'm not going to buy. I'm not in the market for a car. But you know, on on Facebook, my ads are targeted to my actual interests. This is right. this is not a defect, and the product is free for you. The social media site is free for you because they're they're monetizing it in this way. Yeah, and so this was. I mean, it used to be talked about as junk mail, right? Like junk mail is mail you don't want, and advertisers were wasting tons of people's uh, their money and people's time by flooding mailboxes with stuff that they didn't care about. I mean, your argument is essentially that. Sites, whether it's Hulu serving up ads or other programs you might watch or Amazon, they're actually giving you stuff that you might remotely be interested in. Yeah, which is better. This is a this is a positive hack to advertising that that the tech kind of phobia people are treating as necessarily bad and evil and sinister and scary, which it just it, it isn't necessarily. Let's right. let's ease off that. Well, uh, you know, and uh, part of uh, in in various parts of Tech Panic, you talk about uh, you know one of these things is the story about how uh, you know a kid, you know, a, a happy-go-lucky boy, you know, has a kitten. He goes he watches one or two YouTube videos about kittens. And then about five videos, and he's become part of Al Qaeda or ISIS, right? <laughs> a proud boy slash yeah. Al Qaeda. Yeah. Um, talk about that trope and why that's actually not happening. Yeah, it's just nonsense. There's been a, a several uh, good studies of this phenomenon uh, that I reference in the book, uh, but it looks like YouTube was aware that there was a radicalization problem at some point in particular, and you know they made tweaks to how the algorithm recommends you stories. But it appears to be the case, the algorithm is much more likely to recommend you, an extreme person, more moderating content than it is to recommend you, a moderate person, extreme content that's going to slowly radicalize you in some direction. You're, you're more likely to be guided away from like Infowars style conspiracy, um, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I, um, well, you know. Well, yeah. yeah. We don't have to make that judgment. But. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess Infowars is off of YouTube anyway. Yeah. So and so then, now that goes into uh, you know a, a, a larger category of discussion. So I have been very critical in my writing at Reason and other places of a lot of individual moderation decisions that social media sites make. I take seriously the claim that that social media is 
uh, aggressively moderating provocative or right wing or even sometimes left wing content that falls outside of a kind of normy centrist mainstream media approved view. What they've done with some of the you know, so-called COVID misinformation is really has been really despicable in a lot of ways and some other topics. So I, I, I do not deny that there is an issue there and people have been right to call it out. But there's not a, a good solution that's been put on the table. Um, and also, some, so much of the bad uh, judgment calls that social media makes seem to have been pushed on them by our own government or, me or mainstream media institutions that are constantly demanding more censorship or silencing. So, it, so that, isn't the fault with them, not with social media? Does that, um, you know, how, how do you talk about or how do you think about the um, uh, Twitter and Facebook both, you know, either outright killing, spiking links to the Hunter Biden story shortly before the election last fall, or in the uh, case of Facebook, tamping it down and then eventually kicking Trump off. I guess let's, let's talk about blocking that story at Twitter. Like, yeah. why is that a bad thing if in fact, and I, I know we both agree that Twitter, uh, Facebook, et cetera, these are private companies and they do have broad rights to moderate content as they see fit. Um, is it a problem that they, you know, they say to the New York Post, you know, no, we're not even letting people link to that story. I think it is a problem. And they admitted it was a problem. Yeah. They, they apologized. They said they got that call wrong. You know, they had their own kind of internal spokespeople, communications people saying, yeah, oh, we're very concerned that this story is misinformation, uh, you know, suggesting that it's kind of that it's kind of a hoax, not even that its premise is raw, but right. that like the, the information supplied in about the laptop is not is not real. We now kind of all ag agree that it was actual uh, genuine information. So that and they were wrong to do that. And they said as much. So I think it, it was a it was a black eye on those companies. Um, they they shouldn't do that. Um, they said they said they don't do that. They don't want to do that. I don't think claims that, but then you'll hear from the right that, oh yeah, we lost, Trump lost the election because of this. That's just so stupid. I don't think anyone really believes that, do they? I mean, there was a Streisand effect going on here anyway, that, 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 D, that punishing the story made it so that more people were talking about it and sharing it on other social media sites. And I mean, and stories about this story were still available. Like now it's not just this New York Post story, but now there's lots of stories in other places about the action Twitter and Facebook took against this story. So there was actually more attention paid to this than there would have been otherwise. Yeah, I mean, uh, before, because New York Post, uh, the New York Post Twitter account got suspended for a while, but briefly, um, you know, one of the biggest stories on Twitter was the New York Post follow up about being banned from Twitter. But I asked, so I asked for this book, I asked yeah. specifically uh, people at Facebook, so how, what goes into the decision to do this? And it's pretty clear to me they rely on cues from people in positions of authority and in the government and mainstream media uh, institutions. So when you have you know the New York Times and the Washington Post and all the CNN talking heads shrieking at you that you, that that you know Facebook is evil, Facebook allowing this misinformation to be out there is 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 ruining our elections and, and, and these companies should be destroyed. They should be regulated out of existence or broken up or whatever because they allow this kind of thing. Well, of course the companies are terrified. So they're scared into making some bad decisions, some bad calls. But what are we gonna, if we, if, if we got, then you would just have, and this is my argument to sort of like right-leaning people, but then, if you do punish these companies, if you give the, if you give them what the government wants, what the Dem what the Biden administration wants, what the New York Times wants, then you're just left with those institutions that are brutally un far more hostile to a to a conservative worldview than Facebook is. What? Facebook isn't hostile as an as an institution. It's a very important right. platform for non-liberal views. Yeah, I was going to, I mean, it, it, it seems, I guess, uh, non-controversial to say that the people who work at Facebook really hate Donald Trump and, yes. and conservative Republicans, but the platform that, you know, the, the kind of um, coral reef that is Facebook allows these fish to generally swim and do extremely well. Yeah. Why are conservatives so convinced that you know, social media is against them when, you know, it seems unquestionable that social media was not responsible for, but it definitely enabled Donald Trump's rise. I think they're missing the forest for the trees. I think they're seeing a couple truly irritating uh, moderation decisions that we are, again, it's fine to talk right. about, fine to complain about them, but are missing the fact that 
on, at any given moment, the top 10 articles on Facebook are something like from Fox News, Breitbart, right. Ben Shapiro, it's, and so on. And so they're killing it on social media. They need social media. It's good. It's been good for, and, and, and on YouTube, uh, a lot of very far left progressive uh, content has done really well. Mm -hmm. Just outside the kind of confines of what the mainstream media all that they want you to discuss, this limited worldview that has existed for a long time and is now fragmented. Is now Their gatekeeping role is over because of social media. And a lot of us who don't fall into that narrow category, which includes libertarians to a great degree, uh, conservatives, some interesting people on the left, um, we should be happy that that gatekeeping role is over. It's much better for us. It is kind of interesting that... Um... You know, this happened with um, movies about, you know, at a certain point when movies were being supplanted by television, suddenly you saw a lot of movies about how evil television was. Mm -hmm. The effects of TV are bad. I'm sure there were radio plays about Newspapers, how bad movies. So yeah. much, I, I, yeah. My book has so many examples of the New York Times in particular. Yeah. I pick on them a lot, but just inveighing against the harm of, you know, everything from the phonograph to the radio late. Oh, what a car radios. You're going to have radios in your car. Oh, it's just be the end of the world if you can get your source of information from something other than us. So this is an this is an industry fight. They their social media is this upstart rival, and they are they are they are attacking them for that reason. And we should be really clear eyed about that. Uh, by the same token, another story that came out about uh, the kind of larger uh, Facebook uh, penumbra is that Facebook um, was maintaining separate kind of rules for what were what was typically talked about in newspapers as elites, but it turned out that um, there were hundreds of thousands of people, if not more, who were whitelisted in some way where they were able to do and say things that would have gotten lesser people bumped. Um, what do you think about that or the idea that Facebook presents itself and social media in general presents itself as this fabulously flat new world, the, you know, the old promise of cyberspace in the 90s, that Anybody from anywhere had the same voice on, on, you know, on the internet. Nobody knows you're a dog. Nobody knows if you are a Harvard PhD or if you're like somebody living in your your mother's basement. Um, and it turns out that's not true. Um, what do you think about that, or how how should we be factoring that into the way we talk about social media? I think we have to get used to the idea that moderation is always going to look unfair um, because they're not moderating. They're not approving this content before it goes on. There, you know, this happens so much where there's two videos or two users or two, two whatever, things we can compare and one gets taken down or banned or some kind of moderation decision is made. The other thing's still there. And we all, you know, people who care about fairness go, why is this thing gone when this thing is, viol is much more obviously violating the policy? That's because no one flagged that yet. No one complained. It will all, there's just so much content. And, and they're doing it after someone reports it or an algorithm flags it or something like that. So it will always be the case that, that it looks uneven or unequal because it will be. And there's just too much, there's too much content. So they're going to have to, the, the platforms have to have, you know, these kind of ins insufficient or irritating rules right. that will always result in, in disparate impacts. But there's just no other way to do that unless you want to go to a model and, and you know, get, you mentioned 230 and that this would be the model if you yeah. got rid of 230 where the platforms have much greater liability. Yeah, let's talk about that in terms of Section 230. It's a, it's a good bridge into it. Um, Section 230, uh, it, it immunizes uh, most social media platforms and websites from user generated content. So if you're Yelp and somebody says, you know, this restaurant is the worst restaurant of all time and the person, you know, is, you know, beats his dogs or something like that, Yelp doesn't get in trouble. The individual commenter might if you can find him or something like that. The other thing it does is it allows websites to moderate content as they see fit. Um, what is, you know, why are people, again, on the right and the left, why are they so pissed off about Section 230, where this, you know, kind of obscure, you know, code in a 1996 massive telecommunications bill, you know, why is Section 230 such a flashpoint? Yeah, it's funny because, again, both sides really want to get rid of this law, but for different reasons. Um, conservatives have this idea that the law a mistaken idea that this law either already uh, or should 
uh, prevent um, politically motivated or unfair moderation, that there's some that they, they're supposed to be neutral platforms. So if they're moderating content in a way that is not politically neutral, they're no longer entitled to Section 230 protection. That's what many on the right are saying. This is not the case. There is no requirement for neutrality. I mean, if you want to make an argument that there should be a requirement for neutrality, that's a different matter. Josh Hawley has advocated that, but then you're starting to get into, well, so there would be a panel of government people to decide if your platform is sufficiently neutral. This would be a Senate proposal, so as the Senate would convene such a panel. Why would the Democratic-controlled Senate, a, a Democratic-controlled Senate panel for deciding whether Facebook is sufficiently neutral, and that's going to benefit conservatives how? Right. There's just, there's like, I'm, we're missing step two in so many of there's these three-step proposals. The conver you know, on the right in particular, there's always the conversation about shadow banning, that yeah. somehow it's not that Twitter or Facebook is just, you know, completely blocking somebody or they've kicked them off the platform. It's like they've reduced the reach and the influence. Is there any actual evidence of that? I think they do that sometimes. But a lot of times when people say, I've been shadow banned, and you say, what do you mean by that? And they say, well, yeah, my content's not showing up in people's feeds. But it just, it no, what happens <laughs> is that this person hasn't been looking at your, you know, you, you'll, yeah. you'll get into a phase where you're seeing more content from a, a handful of users because you have a high level of engage, engagement with their content. The platform knows how long you spend looking at people's posts. And then it's trying to give you more of that kind of relevant information. So it will just so happen because you've clicked around or something, some people's content will fall out for a while and then it can come back. So a lot of what gets construed as shadow banning is 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 not is it's not taking place. So it it's just kind of ebbs and flows of yeah. you know whether or not your stuff is interesting to people. Yeah, or ebbs and flows and what what's happened to be at the top when I turn on my Twitter feed, maybe it's something from my colleague Christian Brischke mm -hmm. and it just happened to be the <laughs> first thing I saw <laughs> and then I like and favorite it and maybe I make a comment. So then maybe next time I'm on Twitter it's going to show me a Christian Brischke thing too. And so now I'm suddenly seeing less content from uh, from Eric Bain, my other colleague, mm. just because, you know, but it's not nefarious. Twitter's not trying to hide Eric from me. Right. That's just what happens. What, what is the left critique of Section 230? The left critique is that social media has allowed too much bad speech. So they're making the opposite argument. <laughs> Conservatives are saying not enough. Uh, our speech is being too aggressively silenced. And the left is saying they should aggressively <laughs> silence these people more. Section 230 uh, shields the companies from some of the consequences of having provocative speech. So we should get rid of that so that they will purge more bad provocative speech we don't like. What? So they're correct that doing, that like they're tactically, yeah. they're on absolutely solid ground that it would be worse for conservatives, for non-liberals if you got rid of Section 230. It makes perfect sense why Elizabeth Warren hates this statute from her worldview and from what her political goals. It doesn't make sense that Donald Trump and Josh Hawley support it too. What's wrong with uh, liberals or progressives saying, you know what, Twitter, you know, you should, you should mirror our vision of the world and you should shut down people. Like you have the right to shut down people. Why don't you narrow the scope of acceptable discourse? Well, I think that if this is political figures saying this, that actually raises a censorship issue. I mean, the idea that, that the Senate is going to haul, and they've done this how many times now? They're going to haul Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and everyone else you know, in front of Congress Well, every now time. at least they just have to you know, move from one room in their mansion <laughs> to another, right, and hook up a Zoom camera. But these he these hearings are always such a farce. I, anyone who has, has ever watched them comes away, uh, should come away, you know, with... with huge doubts that our regulators, our elected officials who are, you know, in their 80s, have any idea how this technology works, have the smallest, the slightest clue to regulate it in an informed way. Uh, but so no, I find that I find that authoritarian and illiberal and wrong that so Facebook does something wrong or someone is allowed to say something on Facebook and they don't do anything about it quickly enough for Elizabeth Warren or whoever else. And they're going to have to be summoned to Congress to apologize for it. It's ridiculous. And that actually we should fight against because that's wrong. Was face is Facebook implicated in the genocide of the Rohingya? This is one of the stories that comes up again and again, you know, because when social media as a concept or as a reality emerged in the late aughts, it was celebrated. You know, both Facebook and Twitter early on, you know, they helped, you know, foment the Arab Spring. Uh, you know, they helped all the color revolutions were carried via Twitter. Um, you know, are they responsible for bad things happening? That's a good question. They certainly have facilitated some bad things happening, including what you're describing. Um, I, the, the kind of the second half of my book, when I get away from some of the sort of political speech and addictiveness and those topics, you know, I'm 
trying to be a reasonable person, I, I, I think preventing violence is a legitimate function of the government. Um, I, I, I see more um, more leeway for for direct government action if you're if you're trying to address a problem of like genocide happening or if, if social media is fueling but, actual yeah. violence, then sure. But then we have to be careful. Well, is that actually what's going on? It, many of these questions are very hard. So with with the Rohingya, for instance, Myanmar, this was the legitimate military government of the country that is is using Facebook to to inspire attacks on the Rohingya. So they shouldn't pro, they shouldn't allow that. But now you're saying like this wasn't a rebel group. This wasn't right. I, this was the legitimate state government. So. I mean, there are state actors in our own country who, sheriff's departments, who exercise violence in ways a lot of people are not comfortable. Should Facebook start shutting those down? There's something about being the official government of the country, right? That maybe they should be allowed to be on social media, but then maybe they're not if they're advocating. Like, it ends up being kind of a not obvious call for what, you know, if, if you're going to have a blanket policy. Well, this, on this comes kind of back thing. to, you know, the fact that there's a number of authoritarian leaders who are still on Twitter, whereas right. Trump is not. Right. Um, and what you're saying is that it's kind of a complicated call. It is a complicated call because you can obviously make a case that, nope, all these people should be, these platforms should kick them off. You could probably even make an argument that the government could require them to be kicked off because they're, they're, they're advocating for violence. But then it's, it starts to get, it starts to get tricky. Um, the, these, and also these platforms are used by people to be aware of these threats of violence. Um, you know, the, the more we leave people in the dark in these countries where, where, play, where things like Facebook are important sources of information. Also, you have the issue where um, terrorist plots, threats of violence that are made on social media or organized through social media are much more likely to fail. There's a sense in which we want all of our terrorists to be very online, <laughs> to, be, to be very public <laughs> about, you know, posting selfies as they're having these meetings, because then they're, then they're much, easily tracked down by law, much more easily tracked down by law enforcement. A couple of states have passed laws that would defang or, or change kind of Section 230 or, or change the ability of platforms to uh, do moderation. And so one was passed in Florida, which became law and is currently under federal review, so it's not ha happening. In Texas, there was a law that passed. What was in that, and do you think it's gonna hold up, and is it gonna achieve any of its purpose? No, because there were exemptions, too, in these laws, for except where federal law is applicable. Well, that's, that's <laughs> Section 230. So they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, they're going to run up against the fact that, even without Section 230, the First Amendment conveys considerable protection to private entities to set right. their own speech related policies. At the end of the day, that's what this is. I know they're big companies. I know to some extent they're functioning like they're the public square, but they still are private companies that, that make a profit from selling ads. Um, with, and, and there is a powerful um, uh, bulwark against the government intervening to tell them what to do on speech related grounds. And, and particularly that's to compel speech by saying, no, you have yes. to, you have to carry Donald Trump. It's one of the most litigated, honestly, I mean, the first amendment, right, is one of, one of the more ironclad elements of our, of our constitution. Our, this, our Supreme Court is extremely pro free speech in a, in a, you can, you get to do whatever you, we can't tell you private entity what to do sort of way. Now, that is definitely true, but um, people like Clarence Thomas, who uh, is generally considered pretty good on the First Amendment, pretty good on, um, you know, uh, on limiting government, he has said in various conversations or, or in, in rulings or, or, you know, in comments on rulings that actually, you know, maybe it's time to start thinking about social media, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter at all not as public squares, but as common carriers, which then would be regulated because if you're a common carrier, you don't have the right to say who can use your, your um, service or what they can do on it, uh, right. kind of like a phone company. The AT&T, back in the day when it was a government-enabled monopoly, couldn't say, no, you can't have a phone, Rob, because I don't like your politics. Or if you had a phone, they couldn't say, we're gonna bleep your speech if you start saying th something we don't agree with. Right. Um, you know, are these services um, you know, this is where people go to talk about shit, but are they actual common carriers? Yeah, and, and I think if Clarence Thomas was, he would rule that way. Yeah. I haven't seen a lot of evidence that, that, the other, that he's speaking for a view supported by a majority of the court. But people like Richard Epstein, the, you know, who has a podcast at Hoover Institution called The Libertarian. Um, 
you know, has said as much that, that they should be regulated as companies. These platforms are just still very different from the phone company. Again, they're selling ads. They're selling a curated experience for their users. One they think their users want, that they're relying on feedback from their users. They're analyzing what you're doing and they're, they're selling a, a product in a, in a different way than it, it's, it's unique to them in, in a way that wasn't true for the phone companies. And also, you know, you still, okay, even if we decided they're public utilities, it's like you have some right to be there. Like there's still, there's still rules in like, you can get thrown off, you can, okay, a train is a public utility, you get thrown off for saying insane things, right? You, you, there's not some- Just for talking in the quiet car on Amtrak, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. right. That's, but that's a yeah. sensible rule. I Good, if you're in the quiet car when I'm in there and you're on your phone, yes, they should throw you off. Like we support that. Right. So every, in so many of these cases, you'll, you'll hear from people who say they're absolutists. No, we don't want moderation. We just, you know, why are they kicking off people? They shouldn't do this. But then you ha start having a conversation about, well, we all think some level of harassing bullying, um, maybe pornographic, yeah. that kind of, well, no, we don't want any of that. Yeah. And it goes, okay, well, then you start getting, well, what's a, when you get, it, it gets thornier when you start looking at, if you had, you know, a panel of people to decide, uh, there would be disagreements about what they think is, well, obviously we're going to leave that up, yeah. but oh no, obviously when we said we don't want speech moderator, we don't want things taken down or censored. Well, we didn't mean that. We want that gone. Yeah. So it's tricky. So if that argument tends in, in my kind of thinking, and I might be wrong about this, but that tends to come more from the right, from conservatives, and maybe some libertarians or people who claim that mantle. On the left, there's a big, you know, big, big talk about using um, antitrust to break these companies up because there is something awful and evil about Facebook owning Instagram and WhatsApp. Uh, you know, it's just too big and, that, and, you know, it's squelching innovation. It's doing this, it's doing that. What What is the status of actual attempts to break up, say, Facebook in particular through antitrust legislation? The problem that they run into is that there's not a lot of a rationale in existing antitrust law for breaking up these companies because that they're just big and they have too much power and maybe they're unfair to competitors, right? There's nothing in existing antitrust that bars you from being unfair to a competitor. The theory of antitrust is, theory, is harm to the consumer. You know, the idea that one company comes to dominate the, some important market and then because you can't get this service anywhere else, they could raise the price of it because they're not competing and they could punish you, the consumer. Well, that's obviously not what's happening with social media because we're talking about free services in a lot of cases. And also they're not, they do compete in a variety of services. Facebook as a place for political conversations, just conversations in general to happen, is competing with Twitter. As a political ad service, it's competing with Google as a place where you post your pictures, it's, I guess it's pretty unrivaled, but who cares? They're not charging you for the service. It doesn't matter. They're competing with your old photo books, right? right. It's, it's not, a, so they're not, they're not monopolies for any one um, thing. If your view is, you know, you're someone on the left and you just don't like the idea of big companies in general. Which is, I mean, literally the, right. the argument, right? It's coming out of uh, Lewis Brandeis and people like Elizabeth Warren and Columbia Law Professor Tim Wu whose latest book is called The Curse of Bigness, which is a reference to Brandeis. Um, what's wrong with saying, you know what, these companies are just too big. Like they really are really big and that's not good. Yeah, as long as it's not, it's not, it doesn't seem to me to be having any obvious massive harm to customers, to the consumers of these, the users of these companies. In fact, most of them seem to really like the product, I like Google. Google is probably the closest to a traditional monopoly. It, it really is has very little competition in its core search engine function, right. but that's because everybody likes that search engine the best and would use it. They're not charging you for it. They're, they're you know, maybe if they, if they started charging you for it and, and you ha they had no competition, you could make some traditional antitrust argument, mm -hmm. but right now it's just the one everyone wants. Um, and it's probably something else could come. It it's not inconceivable. So many people have a failure of imagination. They think these companies are entrenched and they could never on their own, you know, come to meet their end. You know, even though we've seen turnover for, for what the top 20 internet companies are just over and over and over again. So I don't take that view at all. 
Um, if you want to say we need to do, so I'm trying to be reasonable. You say we need to do something. Like, okay, but why do we need to do something? And then they don't have a very good argument for that, other than we just don't like bigness. Well, we did, did, it's just too much concentrated. Philosophically, I just don't, I don't share that concern. Uh, I'm not seeing what the harm to us is. What do you say about arguments? And Elizabeth Warren is a, you know, is a common thread in this of uh, breaking up a company like Amazon. You can be an umpire or you can own a team, but you can't do both at the same time. So let's break up Amazon. We're doing something to Amazon because Amazon is such a big company and Amazon is using the data it gets from uh, its users to sell its own version of goods. Uh, you know, this is a big complaint of hers that you can either be a marketplace or you can be uh, the seller, uh, you know, a, a fair and neutral marketplace or you can be the seller of your own stuff. But the idea of Amazon basics, uh, you know, cheap kind of, you know, basic, you know, things, commodities, or, you know, you know, any, everything from cords to certain types of clothing, they sell an Amazon basics line and they have an unfair advantage over the branded products that they're selling. Why is she wrong to be concerned about I something like that? I think she like must be that? living on another planet. This is the greatest service ever. You can easily find things you need that make your life better and pay a very reasonable amount of money for them and have them show up the next day on your doorstep. This is this is fantastic. This is amazing, especially during after the last year and a half we just went through the pandemic, right? You, you, when we were told, don't go, don't congregate with other people, don't you know, avoid excess socialization, stay in your home, citizen, this kind of really thing I found very awful. Social media has made this so much easier. You didn't even have to go to the grocery store anymore. It can show up. The things you need can show up on your doorstep with like the click of several buttons. This is a good thing. I don't, the, again, the harm to the consumer is non-existent. This is something that is great. This is a good service that people love. People love it more than, than the government. Amazon's approval ratings are higher than Congress. And that's true actually of most social media companies. So rather than Congress break up big tech, maybe big tech should break up Congress. That would be the version that, that the American public would actually support. Right. You have a chapter in the book on cancel culture and harassment. Let's talk a little bit about that. How do you define cancel culture? And is is it a real thing or in what way is it a real thing? Because, you know, part of the backdrop is that more people have more access to, you know, ways of expressing their opinions and reading other people's opinions. So, like, you know, certainly compared to even 20 years ago, but certainly something like 50 years ago, you know, you can just, you can say what you want and kind of, you know, call it to people's attention. So how does how do things like cancel culture and harassment come into that kind of backdrop? Yeah, the the, the rise of social media has made it easier to uh, criticize people and hold people accountable in a lot of ways that are good. Uh, it has also had the effect of you can criticize and hold people accountable to a degree you probably don't need to, and that they don't deserve it. Uh, people who are not public figures, you know, so much of our speech takes place in text or or video or is recorded or preserved in some way, including speech from when you're a young person. I, I feel lucky to have a, you know finished high school before the era of smartphones, where everything I, young people say and do is saved forever right. and is out there and is lurking to, to ruin your life at a bad moment, maybe 10 or 20 years later. It really is horrible. Yeah. Uh, what, what can happen to people when it, it turns out you said something sexist or racist or homophobic when you were 13, something that everyone on the planet has done. If we're holding people to this level of accountability, no one would ever be able to get a new job or get admitted to college ever again. Um, but social media has allowed this to happen. And I, I do, I think it is a serious problem. I write a lot about it, how we're becoming very unfair, particularly to young people, to non-public people. And I do, social media is responsible for that to some degree. Now there's, there's not a very satisfying way to like put this genie back in the bottle. I'm, I advocate for different norms uh, of just how we conduct ourselves. I, I different norms of journalism yeah, would be the can, first well, thing. Can you uh, kind of lay those out? Like, what's how, you know, how should we treat um, somebody? You know, the uh, uh, Teen Vogue, uh, you know, very left leaning, Condé Nast web only publication. After going through a couple of things, they named a new editor who was a young African American woman. Um, and then it turned out she got canceled very quickly because it turned out when she was in high school, she had made a bunch of anti-gay jokes or, you know, jokes right. at the expense of gay people as well as Asians. So she got canned. Um, 
you know, how, what's the different norm that, is, I mean, is that good and fair or is that? Like, no, it's how stupid she, and bad yeah. and wrong and they should not do that. She apologized and it was a long time ago and that ought to be good enough. It ought to be good enough in all those, those circumstances. Um, no one can survive that level of scrutiny. Actually, uh, one of the leading people who was trying to get her in trouble, though then it turned out that of course that person had also tweeted. Right. And then when you get that person in trouble, the person, that person who got that person in trouble will also have said this something This is the bad. way the world ends. Yeah, no, and it, we just need to disengage from this. Journalists need to practice different norms. I've become more cognizant of the amount of um, harassment and cruelty you can inflict on someone by naming them in a story. So let's be more thoughtful about whether this really matters. If, you, if you're if you going to write a profile of someone, you know, you're a local hometown hero. I mean, that story, had that uh, yeah. so the football uh, guy who had the Venmo me beer money, right. and then they do a profile of him, and the local reporter looks up his old tweets. Why? Don't do that. That's a new norm of journalism. But but that Don't had a that. that had a good ending because the journalist the journalist got fired had, after yeah, they found his tweets. They looked at his tweets. Yeah, and, we need to stop that. No more of that. Okay, so this is like the Greek play um, uh, in the Oresteia, where it's like you just have to at a certain point you have to say, okay, we're no longer just kind of having a cycle of vengeance. Yeah. We're stopping yeah. the killing, and we're just going to have something approaching justice. Yeah, I think social media sites should also you know be very cognizant of. Um, Letting people, I mean, they have policies against harassment, mm -hmm. doxing, uh, revenge porn. Uh, this is, you know, these are serious subjects in which you might, you could probably make a case for some kind of law or, or narrowly tailored fix to Section 230 that requires them actually to take down some of this content. You know, and the trade-off between, you know, privacy and free speech are both things we want to protect. And then sometimes they do butt heads a little right. bit. And and I am actually a libertarian. I don't know, maybe more inclined than others. I don't know to actually. Even though I'm a free speech absolutist, there are some cases where I will I will default in favor of privacy. So to the extent that there's some need for the government to do something on those fronts, I, I can see a way for, for that. I'm interested, for instance, with, um, you know, there, there are some statutes, there's some local laws against um, revenge porn. I think you could treat it, you know, this is publishing people's intimate images without their permission. You could treat it like copyright infringement. You know, you get a takedown request, a site gets a takedown request if you're infringing copyright and then you get a period of time to take it down. So it's not like you're instantly liable the second, you know, you have no control over it and this just happens and then you're in trouble. Uh, something like that seems reasonable to me. I, I, there are a couple cases where technology, the new technology has, will force us to consider things of this nature. And I, I think that's reasonable. Uh, talk a little bit about how you came to be a libertarian. How I came to be a yeah, libertarian? Yeah, what's your origin story? A, you know, radioactive spider? Or <laughs> Mil um, Miltner Rose Friedman bit you on the arm or yeah, something? Yeah, that's, man, that yeah. Would, wouldn't that be the uh, story? No, I, uh, I think I was, uh, I, I came from a Republican household, but my parents were basically libertarians, um, you know, very about uh, uh, low taxes, low regulation, but, you know, leave everybody alone and, and, and seeing that, that, that was, that made, that was consistent. I think it's the consistency that brought me and a lot of people I know to libertarianism that you have one party or at the time, you know, when I was growing up nineties aughts, you have one party saying, yeah, the government's not, should, should be less involved in your finances, but it should be more involved in the bedroom and overseas and in all these other ways. And then the other party saying the opposite thing. Well, no, we really want government to leave you alone in your own decisions and not be harassed by the police. And, and, you know, we're not going to try to destroy other countries, but, but, Yes, we want more of your money and to tell you how to spend it. And just the, the way you 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 solve those those inconsistencies is to become a libertarian. So I did. Yeah. I mean, do you is your pension for kind of consistency? Do you think that's just a, like temperamental or does you know, or did you pick that up somewhere? I used to think everyone has this inner drive to seek this consistency. And this was the best argument libertarianism had going for it. I actually think now. Uh, people are not as motivated by consistency as I used to think, because I, I used to think this was always a slam dunk argument when I'm arguing for libertarianism. Well, I said, well, you think this, what about this? I mean, have you seen that meme, you know, the face just saying, yes, yeah. it's right. It's people are, are, are happy to kind of, or at least some of the people engaged in uh, ideas on the right and the left, I think are just like perfectly happy to revel in their own hypocrisies on these things and say, nope. We're not doing your thing where no one is in control of anyone's lives. Or maybe that sounds good in theory, but our enemies are going to win that way and they're going to be mm -hmm. in control. So we need to be in control. Like they're, you know, they've got the ring and they're saying it's a, this is a gift. Let Gondor use it. That's everyone in this conversation these days. And that's, and that's a problem for liberty because we're just saying this has gone wrong so many times. Of course, it's going to be no better with you in charge. Why do you have any, you know, thought 
to to the this will this will this will work out this time. But are you optimistic for libertarian ideas? Uh, you know, the, on some levels, you know, on many profound levels, it seems like you know just. Um, not a very libertarian time. Government spending is massive. Government debt is massive. Control of our, you know, whether we're wearing masks or what documents we have to show in order to go to a bar or, you know, a restaurant. Um, on the other hand, you know, foreign policy seems to be in a place that is more non-interventionist, which is a kind of traditional libertarian thing. You know, gay marriage or marriage equality, drug legalization. Uh, positive views towards immigration um, seem to be on the upswing. And we have a lot of these technologies that are allowing us to live how we want on our own terms. Um, you know, what do you think? We're, sum up the, the current sure. moment. The, I think we should be clear eyed about the pandemic and pandemic restrictions that this has been a, a I agree with Joe Jorgensen, our Libertarian Party candidate, who said this is, you know, like a just unbelievable, uh, vast expansion of, of government policy that I wouldn't have even necessarily guess that so many Americans would go along with it. I mean, now you have and 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 our political elites are are they're reveling in their hypocrisy. They they how many mayors get to be caught, you know, at the third jazz club of the night unmasked while you the citizen, you the citizen should be should you should, you know, wrap a mask, two layers of mask around your child, your screaming child before you get them into the school. Um, I, I think it is it is horrible the amount of restrictions we have said it is okay. The amount of arbitrary, capricious the government can tell you what to do at all times, and it's for your own good, and you can't question it. Uh, so that's the bad, and it is very, very bad. Don't get me wrong, but it is better actually that we that this is happening at a time where we do have social media the way it, that there is so many ways to complain about this and to discuss this the media is the biggest cheerleader the mainstream media is the biggest cheerleader of permanent pandemic restrictions on our lives that has that would have ever existed i can you imagine if this is happening and we have no way to discuss to express opposition to have conversations with people who are skeptical of this except for uh CNN, your local newspaper, the New York Times, the you know the the people who are just going to reflect the preferences of the Biden administration or of, of, of lawmakers in general, that would be a lot worse. So social media is 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 we should leave it as this free, uninhibited, freewheeling space where the conversation is sometimes messy, sometimes people say things that are wrong or that are scary or that we don't agree with, but it is still so much better to have this open-ended conversation than to, to go back to an era where a, a small number of people with a very limited, very wrong worldview had complete control of the conversation. How worried should we be that it's sometimes social media companies, I mean, this started in, I guess, 2018, but Facebook, Twitter, Apple, uh, at various points, um, Tim Cook said, you know what, the tech industry is out of control and we welcome regulation. Facebook is running ads saying, you know what, you know, uh, internet regulations haven't really changed since 1996 when the Communications Decency Act passed. You know, uh, obviously they need to be updated and they're angling for that. How, how implicated in whatever is happening are the companies themselves? Yeah, Facebook is all, of, all on board with making these changes, these changes that will be shepherded, in, <laughs> shepherded into law by, by the revolving door of people who go from media to Facebook to, to the White House and, and so on and so forth. Um, actually, Twitter doesn't want to change a lot of these laws because they rightly view themselves as a smaller competitor. And if you if you made policies that social media sites have to do more moderation, well, Facebook can handle that just right. the way Walmart doesn't mind if you raise minimum wage because you put all their competitors out of business first. It's a very similar dynamic. It's, it's, it's actually a very self-apparent one to libertarians or free market conservative type people. Um, I also think to some extent, maybe Facebook or the other social media sites are just saying they want to go along with regulation, but then what does that actually look like? You know, they want to, we're open to it. We're open to it. The right regulation. One we had an in, had input on and made sure was not the bad one that we didn't want. So there's a, there's a certain amount of cynicism I take with that. Um, you know, the subtitle of Tech Panic is why we shouldn't fear Facebook, which we've talked about, and we shouldn't fear the future. How do we get past a kind of panic stage with social media or with big tech right now? What, you know, what, what are the ways that we can kind of moderate um, you know, people's visceral reactions? 
people need to train themselves to just like not believe what the media is saying about any of these things. Uh, I really, the, the mainstream media is the villain of this book and is the villain of so much that's going on. The, 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 the narrative that they advance that everything new is scary and dangerous because it competes with them. Yeah, I, they Clubhouse, the, uh, this popular uh, uh, audio uh, kind of uh, group yeah. social media app that, that was really briefly popular during the pandemic because it was a way to chat with people. You know, the New York Times has this just absurd <laughs> coverage of this thing. Like, well, what if it's not going to be recorded? So what if people are saying... They can say whatever they want. They'll say whatever they want. It's not going to be fact-checked. Yeah. End of the world. Like that kind of, that is moral panic. And it has been the bread and butter of newspapers, of local television, of, uh, you know, what are your what are your neighbors doing? It's be afraid for your children, that kind of thing. Um, that's why I call it a panic. And, and, and you know, we and all of the so many of those in the past have turned out to be nothing to them from from video games to to the radio to the you know, to the, the New York Times said uh, I, I found this for the book. The New York Times said um, Alexander Graham Bell should be hung from the neck until dead because, well, now people can be calling each other all the time. This would be the end of the world as we know it. We got to really train ourselves to not fall for that kind of thing. That's a good point to leave it on. Robbie Suave of Reason, thanks for talking. To Reason, the newest book is Tech Panic, Why We Shouldn't Fear Facebook and the Future. Thank you.